The next stage of our study of intonation is what are called pre-nuclear patterns. Now obviously if you look at that word, um, if it's not a word that you've seen before, if you look at that word, you'll recognize um, part of the word nucleus, so pre-nuclear patterns. We're going to look at part of the international phrase that occurs before the nucleus. So again, quite a number of ideas to think about. Um, I can see various people engaging in semaphore. Does that mean some people haven't got a handout? Are you wanting a handout or are you trying to attract somebody's attention on the back? <laughs> You're okay, are you? Right. And has everybody else got the handout then? Excellent, okay. So, we need to start with a definition then, answering this question, what is a pre-nuclear pattern? And the first of these diagrams is one that you've seen before, the diagram showing you the components of the international phrase. And next to it is one where the phrase is filled in. It's example one on your handout. So a pre-nuclear pattern will be found when you've got syllables preceding the nucleus, syllables at the beginning of the word group before we get to the nucleus. The name given, in fact, to the tunes or patterns, pitch patterns that you find on these syllables. Combination of these units in brackets there, the pre-head and head. So we're today looking at the first two units of the international phrase. And as you know, we've done the last two, so we're well on the way to being extremely accomplished um, as far as intonation is concerned. So if we've got a pre-nuclear pattern, either the head or the pre-head or both of them will be present. And I say either the head or the pre-head because as we know, they've both got brackets around them, they're both optional, and they don't have to co-occur. You can have one without having the other. It doesn't matter which. So we'll see how this works by building a few international phrases, having a look at the different permutations of the components. So in example two, you have got a just got a nucleus, there's nothing else, and that is, you can read that, you don't actually need to do it. How does this sound? No. No, that's right, yes. Excellent, good. So, no, no, high ball, nucleus only, no pre-head, no head, no tail. No way. No way, that's right. So now we've got a nucleus and a tail. No way. And these are patterns that we practiced. We tried them out yesterday, didn't we? Now, something new. So this will be more difficult. We now have a head. And we have a head because we can see there are syllables here before the nucleus. And it actually says, going nowhere. Going nowhere. Excellent. And now we've got the whole thing. I put a pre-head in as well, so I've got a pre-head ahead, and then still the nucleus and tail. And you can see there's a lot here, with the first stress on going, and it says, I'm going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. Bravo, that's excellent. Now, the tail, as we know, is optional. So I could drop the tail and just have, I'm going out. I'm going out. You're doing a very good job here. I mean, I'm almost redundant, aren't I? This is really good. <laughs> oh, this one's a bit sad, isn't it? What we've done now is we've dropped out the head, and I've changed the phrasing slightly to, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. Yes, that's sort of, I'm nobody. That's the sort of thing you might usually say with a low four, I think. <coughs> I'm nowhere. Yes, well, I, I said I've changed the wording slightly. Exactly. So you can, you can read your handout or you can read what I put on the screen. I did warn you. <laughs> Thank you. And then, going out. 
going out. So we've lost kind of the crust on the bread and butter, haven't we? We've taken the two outside bits on and we've just got the middle of the sandwich now, the head and the nucleus. Going out. Going out. And finally, I think this is finally on these, a pre-head and a nucleus, missing the head and the tail, says, I'm out. I'm out. That's really good. So I think you can all give yourselves a pat on the back for that. It sounds like a very encouraging chorus. That's really good. Now, those are the permutations that are possible. Okay? And the reason why there aren't more is obviously because the nucleus is always there, so we can't take that out. That one's always going to be there, and then the other three bits fit round it. So, let's look at the new bits. Let's look at the heads and pre-heads in more detail, starting with the pre-heads, because after all they come first. And the pre-head consists of any syllables preceding the first accent. Now, this is a good example because it shows you, it reminds you very graphically what an accent is. An accent is a stressed syllable that is noticeably different in pitch from what has preceded it. And here, easier is very different from it was it was it was easier than I expected. And there's our other new accent here, one with a moving tone on it. So we've got a nice picture here of accents actually at work. It was easier than I expected. That's right. Now, these syllables, these pre-head syllables, will have one of two patterns. They'll either have um, a very high pitch or a comfortably lowish pitch. And that example in example one is going to turn out to be one of the comfortably lower ones. It was easier than I expected. And example 10, I. You have to jump now past two to nine that we've just looked at, all right? Example 10 has a slightly longer one of these low pre-heads. So it's comfortably low, but you can see it's not fully low because it's not actually touching the bottom line. Okay, so it's up a tiny bit on the way to a mid-level pitch. Low pre-heads can be quite long. It was really quite a lot. It's really quite a lot easier than I, if I extend that one that we've just been looking at, it's really quite a lot easier than I, it's really quite a lot. And that's all in the low pre-head, there's no stresses there, nothing, nothing prominent of any kind. It was very long, low pre-head. So it can be quite long, um, and it's also the most common pre-head, it's the one that we use most of the time when we're talking, and for that reason, it's called often the unmarked pre-head. And that takes you back to the idea of marked and unmarked, the linguistic terminology that we talked about when we first met. So I'm using it again here. Unmarked, unremarkable, commonplace every day. <coughs> the other thing about this one, it is literally unmarked. We don't have to put a mark in the transcription for it. It's the default position. So if you don't see a mark, you know it has to be the low prehead. So there's no genetic marking to learn for this. So this one sounds, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> the high one, however, is a bit different. The high prehead is generally produced on a pitch it's about where you'd expect to start a high fall. So it's fairly well up in your pitch range, well above the mid-level pitch. And I think possibly because of this, high preheads are usually quite short. They never get to be as long as the low prehead can get. It's the least common, and it's quite noticeable when we say it. And because of this, because of this fall, factor, it's called a marked prehead. And the other interesting thing about it, it is physically marked. You can see there a little raised line at the top of the print line. Um, and that says 
high prehead. Now that is the only tonetic symbol that is not a stress. So it's not marking a rhythmic beat. It is telling you, raise the pitch of your voice. It's almost as if a tiny bit of this top line has been taken down and drawn here to show you that, in fact, your pitch is well up in the range. And this one, example 11, remember 10? It was amazing. It was amazing. This one, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs>
So the falling head is going to start with about the height of a high fall nuclear tone, and it's going to fall gradually in pitch, as you can see it doing there. The first stress is the downward pointing line, or in some publications, and in the original O'Connor and Arnold publication, you'll find this arrow that I've used here. And again, any subsequent stress is a zero because you've already been told what to do. You don't need new information when you get here. You just need to know to put a beat. All right? So this one typically combines only with the full rise nuclear tone. And so in example 14, we get something like, I'll try to ring you back this evening. I'll try to ring you back this evening. I'll try to read back this evening. Good, okay. Well, if you like that, try reading number 13. How do you think number 13 will sound? I don't have that on the slides, it's just on the handout. Yes, I can hear some really good ones. We can't be served. That's right, we can't be served. That's very good. That's excellent. types to think about. The first one of the remaining two types is the rising head, another moving head, which it starts fully low. You can see it down here at the bottom below. So there's the low free head. It's even lower than that. And it gradually rises in pitch. So you could like join those dots in a straight line. So you put a ruler through them and draw a line. So each one is incrementally higher than the previous one. First stress is marked with an upward pointing line or an upward arrow, and uh, this example uses the arrow. And again, any subsequent stress, just as you would now come to expect, would be a zero. If there was another stress, it would be a zero, because this is the one that tells you what to do. Now, this one combines only with the high fall nuclear tone. And what that means is that if you choose a high fall, you now have a choice. You can choose a high head, or you can choose a rising head. And this one will sound, it's absolutely intolerable. It's absolutely intolerable. That's right. Absolutely intolerable. Very good. The last one, the low head, is produced entirely on your bottom pitch, and you can see it's compressed right down there, um, low all the way through. The first stress, again, is a proper little stress mark, but just like the high head was at the top of the line, the low head is now at the bottom of the line. So anything that is fully low gets put at the bottom of the printed line, just like sort of the low-rise nuclear tone yesterday, and again here with it. But a subsequent stress is, guess what, a zero, that's right, uh, because you've had your instructions here and you ought to be able to remember. Nothing changes, it stays low and level. So, this one again is very restricted in its use and it typically combines only with the low rise nuclear tone. And what this means is that for high falls and for low rises, in each case, you have a choice. Here, you have a choice between a high head and a low head. And this one sounds something like, it ought to be perfectly clear. <laughs> it ought to be perfectly clear. Don't you dare ask a question. <laughs> so, yeah, it's got that kind of slightly grumpy ring to it, hasn't it? You think, oh, mustn't, mustn't move, mustn't say anything, mustn't ask. I ought to have understood. So when anybody uses that tune, back off a little bit, because there's obviously something going on. Right. So those are the four basic types. Um, we have a high head, and you can see the mark up there. It ought to be perfectly clear. A falling head. It ought to be perfectly clear. A rising head. It ought to be perfectly clear. And a low head. It ought to be perfectly clear. 
There's a great one, that. <laughs> so that's the summary of what we've looked at so far. But of course, the next thing that we want to know is what these things sound like when they get themselves combined with the nuclear tones. And O'Connor and Arnold identified 10 basic tune types, 10 tunes. Obviously, there are more because we can, as I said, once we get sophisticated at this, we can break the basic rules. But as a working framework, this is ideal. This covers most possibilities. And so it doesn't go as far as John Wells's intonation book, but it's more than enough for actually teaching intonation to non-native speakers, and many of you are engaged in doing exactly that. And those of you who aren't are in the process of actually learning the intonation and becoming proficient in it. And so it's actually a very good framework to use on a course of this kind. So I'm sticking with this, and I won't go beyond it, but we're going to start by exploring the possibilities of the high head. And the first type of combination is a high head and a high fall. This, I think, is the most frequently used combination of all, so this is one that you absolutely have to learn. And I've expanded the utterance a little bit, and it, so it now sounds, it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us, sorry to most of us, it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Would you try it? It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. So you can see, can't you? There's our high head. There's our pre-head. There's our high head, nice and level. Up a little bit to start the high fall, which goes straight to the bottom. And in the low tail, it doesn't move. It stays fully low. Okay? Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Let's combine that now with the low fall. A high head and a low fall. This is not so common. But we have ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you can see the difference, can't you? Look, we've gone down now to the beginning of the falling tube. Compare it with the high fall that we just saw, which has that kind of line. Clear to most of us. Now the new one, clear to most of us. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. All right? And then the transcription, I think, is fairly clear. Big enough to see where all the zeros are. Stress marks, the genetic stress marks. All the detail. I had a full a rise fall, sorry. I'm reading backwards. I had a rise fall. Now, this is the tune that you can safely forget. This is the very rare one, which almost certainly means that you've completely remembered it. This always happens. But you really don't need this one. So if this one worries you, just forget about it. You can see the mark up here. I'm still keeping the same nucleus, but you can see I've changed the nuclear tone now to match this um, rise ball that we've got up here. And it's going to be like this. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to and I'm using clear as two syllables. Clear to Christmas. Okay? It ought to be perfectly clear to Christmas. That really does sound a little bit old fashioned. It sounds as if I'm kind of, you know, um, I don't know, a tweedy old gentleman in a, with whiskers and my glass of brandy by the fire with my slippers on. It, it, it's, it is, it's, it's a bit dated in many ways. Um, you still hear it occasionally, but it's rare. Okay? You can see the shapes and you can see what's going on. Then we get the high, four, high head, sorry, and a 
a low rise. I had a low rise. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you can see here, clear to most of us. When we talked about the tails yesterday, we talked about that direct rise in the tail. We have two types of rising tails. This is the one that rises directly, systematically, all the way through. And you can see it doing that in this line. Or to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you just go on climbing up through the syllables. Makes a big difference, doesn't it, having that high head instead of the low head with the low rise. Completely different attitude. I sound quite friendly and approachable if I say it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. But it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you really would if I drop that head and start hesitating about whether you could ask me a question or not. So a very different attitude comes from the head there. High head and a high rise. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Goes much higher. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you can see that obviously the big difference again is that we don't go as low on the starting point as we did with the low rise. There's the sort of traje trajectory for the low rise, and here's the one for the high rise above it. So there is, but they're the same shape, it's just that one starts much lower in my pitch range than the other one does. Now we get on to something a little bit sophisticated here. This is, this is for advanced learners of intonation. This is called the compound tune. And Effectively, it behaves as if we're going to have high full nuclear tone. But it's almost as if the speaker has had an afterthought while they're on their way through the tail. And make it a bit different, give it a rise. So it's like a combination of a high fall, which takes place on the nucleus, and then we just throw a rising tone into the tail for good measure. So let's see what that means. We use the two tonetic stress marks, this one on the nucleus, and then this one replaces the stress in the tail to say we want you to take the pitch up. All right? So we go down, and then we have a low rise, and it sounds like this. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And you can hear it most of the bus. You can hear it going up, just as if it was a, a low rise tone in that tail. Ought to be perfectly clear to the us. You'll see in a minute that this is, is quite different from what happens with the full rise, which we'll come back to when we change heads. So you will see that that's different. Ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. The other <coughs> tone that the high head combines with is the mid-level tone. And um, what we've got here is note that I've reduced the tail. Do you remember I said that tails after mid-level tones are usually on the short side and almost certainly won't have another stress in it? Because if you go to stress, you start to think, which one was the nucleus then? because the pitch doesn't change. So I've chopped the utterance off, made it shorter, and we've got, whoops, sorry, chopped chop, chop it all off the food. <laughs> chopped the utterance off, made it shorter. It ought to be perfectly clear to, and then suddenly, maybe I've realized I shouldn't have said something, so I've stopped, and I'm on that mid-level pitch. Ought to be perfectly clear to, stop. And you can tell I haven't finished. You, if, if you weren't looking at me or you weren't, weren't something really, you'd suddenly find your attention drawn. What's she going to say next? Because I've stopped in that middle. I've hesitated on a kind of plateau without committing myself. Right. Now, all of those, all seven combinations, were combinations using the high head. But as we know, we've got other heads. We've got falling, rising, and low. 
So what we need to do next is to explore what happens if we move down the vertical axis, move from the high head to the falling head. We find that the falling head, as we said, typically combines only with a full rise. And this is the other tune that you really, really need. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And look at the difference. When we had this one, when we had this one, when we had the high fall plus the low rise, we saw it go down like a high fall and then directly up like a low rise. But now, on the complex tune here, it planes out, it gets up to about mid-level pitch and then it stops going anywhere, it just fizzles out. So it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. Now, that sounds as if you were writing it down, you might go dot, dot, dot. It sounds a bit uncertain. Maybe you're going to disagree with me. Maybe it's not clear to most of us. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's got a kind of hesitation to it, that tune, which wasn't there in the compound, which sounded very authoritative. It ought to be perfectly clear to us. Us, done and dusted. So no questions asked. But this one, it ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. I wonder. And the native speaker is very, very sensitive to that difference. So once you begin to hear the difference, you can actually measure your progress through the acquisition of intonation, can't you? Because as soon as you begin to think, oh, yeah, maybe there's something in that, then you know that you're getting to quite an advanced level of operation with this. OK, the rising head. Now, this was the one that associated principally with the high fall. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It's like you're climbing up to a diving board and then taking straight off, isn't it? It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And that's the one that gives you the choice. You can have a high head, or you can have this slightly more exciting, more interesting one, the rising head. And then finally, the low head, which goes to the low rise, and this is the one that we've heard already, so we know it's going to sound a bit grumpy. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. It ought to be perfectly clear to most of us. And that's it. That's the ten tunes. So it's quite a lot, isn't it? It's quite a lot already, but it's not the end of the story. Because... Native speakers are never satisfied. And what they do is they play around with all the bits and pieces that you've seen, with the tones and the accents and different head types, to add what is called emphasis. So if intonation by itself in its basic unmarked form isn't enough, to attract attention, the native speaker of English has other strategies. An emphasis is the use of a particular range of such strategies, but making sure that you hear what I'm saying, making sure that you get the message, making sure that you understand and pay attention. So we've got four main ways of doing this. Key switching, which we've encountered, emphatic heads, which adds a little bit more to the head story, pitch jumps, and multiple nuclear tones. Key switching, we saw key yesterday. This involves varying the pitch range being used, usually by adjusting the upper line, by making it a narrow, medium, or wide bandwidth that you're operating in. Right? Most speech is in a neutral or mid-key, but for various purposes, just as we saw in yesterday's lecture, we can use a low key or a high key. So the next thing on the list was emphatics, emphatic heads, and this is where there's something new to say. These are variants of 
three of the four head types, three of the unmarked head types. And by adjusting what's happening on the stress syllables, we can get what is called a stepping head, a sliding head, or a climbing head. And again, this is quite sophisticated stuff. So you might all want to go away and practice these, not today. You can save it for next week, you know. Don't rush. But the emphatic heads are, the emphatic heads are ones in where we make a pitch change on each stress. So instead of just having rhythmic beats, we have a whole succession of accents. Let's see how we do it. Example 20 in your handout gives you a picture of a stepping head. Stepping head starts as if it's going to be a high head, because this is the one it's related to. The high head is the unmarked head, the stepping head is the emphatic or marked version of that head. But what it does is on each stress, instead of staying level at that high pitch, it steps down like going downstairs. So watch the screen and you'll see what's going on. And you see, it's no longer a straight flat line. It has stepped down on each stress. And that's going to sound, we simply can't believe it. And I go back up my simply can't believe it happened. So it's not kind of shock horror. We simply can't believe it happened. Sounds much more surprised, much more shocked than we simply can't believe it happened, which sounds very everyday, very ordinary by comparison. So this head has added emphasis. It makes an additional point. It tells the speaker more about your attitude to whatever it is that has happened. You'll see that the first stress is marked in exactly the way you would expect a high head to start, but then we no longer have zeros because we do have new pitch information. So the successive stresses now are repeats of that little tonetic mark. So our zeros have turned into stress marks. Okay. This one you can get before all the terms except the full rise, so it behaves distributionally exactly like um, the high head. I think the high four is the one it most commonly is heard with, but you can do it for other terms as well. So the big difference then is the change in pitch as you go along and the way you actually reflect that in your international markup by changing the the image changing the genetic stress symbol that you use. No zeros in emphatic heads, but repeats of the start mark. Sliding head. Hmm. Dots all over the place in this one. Sliding head restarts the fall on successive stress syllables. And what it does here is, again, creates a series of accents. See it doing it. I never imagined she'd be so upset. So it says, I never imagined she'd be so upset, but I never imagined she'd be so upset. And you can hear it, can't you, making its way down. Okay. And again, this adds more emotional input from the speaker. It tells you more about the speaker's attitude. I have no 
sort of records of finding it anywhere else. The final emphatic head, climbing head. You can easily see what's happening here. The climbing head restarts the rise on successive stress syllables. And again, it creates a series of accents in that way. Okay? And how that's going to sound is, I never imagined she'd be so upset. I never imagined she'd be so upset. That's right, yes. And you can see exactly what's happening in the marker. You've got your head start mark as if you're going to have a rising head. But, oh, you repeat the rise. So you repeat the symbol. Okay? So successive upward pointing lines or arrows. And this one, like the rising head, tends to be restricted to use with the high fall. I never imagined she'd be so upset. There were two other ways of adding emphasis. One was pitch jumps. And this simply involves choosing components that maximize differences in pitch. <coughs> And you can see there, high P head, followed by a rising head and a high fall. I don't even want to discuss it. I don't even want to discuss it. And now a high P head with a low fall. Again, a big gap between the two pitch levels. Can I put this bag on the table, Bob? Let's 
to go on. Now, is there anything that we need to amend here? First intonational phrase, anything to change in that? No, because there is nothing pre-nuclear. It starts with the nucleus, and it sounds like... Excellent. Certainly, Peter. What about this one? Do I have anything to change here? No. No. So what, what have I got here, then? High head, that's right, and then a high call. And how's that going to sound? That's right. Move those books. Move those books. Okay. So you've got your rhythmic beats, and now you've got instructions on where to pitch your voice. And the last international phrase, anything to add there? No, that's perfect as well, isn't it? So what you ought to be able to see here is that if you actually follow through when you're dealing with an intonation in a text, if you do it the way that we've done it, by the time you get to this stage, you're just fine-tuning it. You're just editing the last little details. There's a lot of even just putting in your rhythmic stresses in the first place and then underlining your nucleus has done a huge amount of the work for you. People always want to jump in at the deep end, but I always say to my students, if you're systematic, if you take a systematic approach to it, you can find that you've done most of the work before you get to the bit that's difficult. Okay? So this question sounds... Have you been shopping? Have you been shopping? That's right. Very good. So we haven't got anything to change. We've got high heads in those two last international phrases, and no head at all in the first one. Anything to amend here? Yes, there is. You're absolutely right. Now, I was hoping that somebody would read this first international phrase, and I would be able to say yes. So what is it that you've got to amend? The stress on a round. Yes, the stress on a round. And what have you got to do with the stress on a round? A high circle, that's right, it's got to be a zero at the top, hasn't it? So that one's got to be changed, and it's got to look like that. Why? Because it's the second stress, the second rhythmic beat in this high head, so there's nothing new in terms of pitch, you've got the instruction here, so it needs to turn into a zero. And that's what I mean by just fine-tuning it. Even if you didn't, you'd have, I've been walking around all... It would be okay, because it would look like a stepping head. So it would still be legitimate. All right? So. I've got even more enthusiastic about homework today. And you have one other little job to do. Take this slowly and... Right, now I might say it that way or I might say it this way. Uh,